Welcome everyone to our case study on third-party risk management. This case study will be done by Kai Taylor, the third-party risk management administrator for AgFirst Farm Credit Bank. Ms. Taylor has been with AgFirst for the past two years, leading the development and deployment of the, third, the, the bank's third-party risk management program. The program is ultimately designed to create accountability and standardized oversight, providing assurance to the bank's regulator and board of directors that third-party risks are being managed effectively. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to Kai. Thanks, Kai, for joining us today. Thank you, Lauren. So I wanted to um, start off by just giving you a little bit of background about who AgFirst are. As a organization, we have a little bit of a different setup in the sense that we are not a commercial bank. We are a federated cooperation and we have 19 affiliated associations and provide services to those, actually to 20 associations across 18 Eastern states. Um, it also includes Puerto Rico, um, although we have a little bit of a different service model. Um, why it's so important to understand um, our setup is it gives you a bit of a better understanding as to why we are tackling third party risk management the way that we are. AgFirst operates as, um, as I said, a federated uh, cooperative and we provide funding to all of our associations. Our associations um, therefore provide funding to the borrowers. So our, each of our 19 associations are our customers. So we are proud to come from a heritage service and even prouder that we continue to fulfill the mission today. At AgFirst, uh, throughout the farm credit system, we have rural communities thrive and keep the wheels turning of agriculture. Our focus is our customers. And that when I say customers, again, we're talking about the associations, not the borrowers. Um, we provide loan, our associations provide loans to the farmers and, and that's things like running an upgrade of their operations to um, setting up a new farm. So we have a variety of mortgage, mortgage and funding requests that the associations get. So we have to look at the broader uh, landscape to understand um, how to help our customers. So AgFirst provide a broad range of services to our associations to keep them running efficiently. We give associations any size um, of our associations of any size uh, because we have multiple different ones who are different in size um, depending on the location. And we try to give them the same power uh, to compete with much larger scale um, corporations and financial institutions. So looking at our service models, you can see that we provide services that you would expect with any um, organization. But the key here is that we are outsourcing and looking at third parties to help us deliver our core, com uh, our core competency. So we may have, we do have all of these different departments. So we have marketing, we have our financial department, human resources. However, we do look at third parties who can help us um, provide an emphasis on our service offering to our associations. So when you understand the complexity of one organization and having multiple services, you can then start to understand where you have 20 associations who sit underneath our service model and how complex some of those agreements can be. So we are governed by Fong Credit uh, Administration. Uh, this is body who um, help um, all of our wider Fong Credit system be accountable for making sure that we manage risk. The Farm Credit uh, Administration, they also look to other um, regulations to keep update, updated on what they're doing. So um, this year, for example, they have been working closely with CFTB um, and working closely with FFIEC to make what we do under the Farm Credit Administration a lot, lot more robust. 
So when I was building out what we're doing on third party risk management, initially we start at Farm Credit Administration, but it was equally important to look at um, all of those other areas and look at all of the other regulations to see whether there are items that are in those regulations that we should be taking into account as part of our framework. So we looked at all of the other regulations out there and we um, actually looked at what they had included to make sure that organizations were risk averse. We're never going to avoid risk, but we should always be taking the steps to try and make sure that we can address risk as quickly as possible with minimal impact. Financial services has the second highest capita cost per data breach. Um, the top is actually healthcare. So it's so important for us as a financial organization to be proactively trying to work to avoid um, the highest impact that we could possibly get. The impacts ratings, it could be camel ratings, um, you could get a memorandum of understanding. So there's a few things that potentially could come from a breach. And the key here to remember is it's not just about you as an organization. It's not that we are regulated by um, FCA, the key is the service that you're procuring. So when you start to look at outsourcing and they could be covered by a different regulation, it's important to understand what regulation they are covered by and making sure they're compliant with their regulation because their failure could ultimately um, end up being our failure because we did not verify that they were compliant. So to give you, just to give you a bit of flavor about some of the challenges that we are seeing in the third party risk management domain right now, and it's having a great, great impact on how we are looking at uh, our framework and the things that we do. So we're seeing that there is a growing risk landscape um, and we're seeing that every year there is more and more um, that is coming at, in way of third party risk, whether that is cybersecurity breaches, um, whether that is um, getting some more prescriptive laws and regulations. I know that we, are, we have recently seen CCPA um, implemented. Um, we're seeing GDPR coming our way um, very shortly. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's coming. And we're seeing a few states implementing those laws now. So we're seeing that the risk landscape is growing, which means that as we continue to um, outsource to third parties, it's important for us to make sure that our programs and our frameworks are evolving with those changes. We're seeing a greater emphasis by regulators, and I think that's across the board. It's not just in the financial industry. Um, the regulators are now seeing that third party risk management is actually one of the highest risks to an organization. So they're taking a greater look at how they can make their regulations more prescriptive, more um, so they can come in and audit a bit more closely to make sure that we're doing the right things. And as I said earlier, there's an increase in outsourcing. Outsourcing and um, is a big, big thing for organizations. So instead of us needing to increase our headcount, outsourcing allows us to keep our operations running by still maintaining the integrity of what we are implementing into the organization. But the key here for the challenge is the availability of technology. Technology gro is growing very quickly, but it's not necessarily growing as quickly as we would expect it to, um, or potentially some of us really want it to. So where we are today is potentially not where we're going to see a third party risk management in five years time. So from an outcomes point of view, you'll see that what we are doing in Ag First is trying to address some of those challenges in the best way that we can. We have created automation to link um, directly to questionnaires. So we're looking at things like regulations and laws and things where we can tie them to a question in a questionnaire. So when we send those risk assessments out to the vendors, we can quickly identify where there are um, risk issues and where we may need to do some mitigation efforts. Um, enhanced reporting is great for audits. So again, while we are making this, taking the steps to make our processes and programs more efficient, we have to keep the reporting moving at the same frequency so that we can evidence quickly so that we can address any concerns that auditors or the regulators may have. So the key here is ensuring that we are um, enhancing our programs, enhancing our questionnaires, and just trying to stay abreast of what the, cha the challenges are in the industry.
So I wanted to share some of the things that I use um, to, in order to help me do that. So um, there are various different TPRM resources out there for people who are looking to stay abreast of what's going on in the industry and look at what's available for them to hone in maybe on their skills. I use it as a way to keep my skills um, topped up, keeping aware, keeping aware of what's going on out there, liaising with other people in the third party risk management industry. So you could go on training and courses. That is one avenue that you could look into. Another way is community and sharing. So there's various different third party risk management um, associations, groups, um, special interest groups. There, there are various different things out there. This is just an example of a few of those, but that is a great way to connect with other people in the industry, discuss challenges, and again, conferences and summits is a great way to connect with other people and see what how they are addressing their challenges and how you potentially could address yours in a similar manner. White, pipe, white papers is one thing that I use um, very often, and I like to refer back to those where we have experts who are doing their research and providing crucial information about maybe changes in, in the industry, um, changes in risk, and things that we can do to um, enhance our programs and just stay abreast of what is coming in the industry. So I just wanted to share because I think it's, it's really important to um, make sure that we're all using the best of the resources that we have and third party risk management is definitely an area which is very scarce so it's sometimes very difficult to understand and find the resources that you potentially need or want and this was just to share that there are things out there that potentially could help um, another organization with just staying on top of their program and what they're doing so to share with you our roadmap and what we have done so far to what we're going to be doing in the future. Um, we started with the deployment in 2018 um, of the out of the box third party risk management program. That included just the simple risk assessments, due diligences and scorecards, just making sure that at a minimum we were doing the bare requirements as to what was expected for um, the regulator. In 2019, we actually did, took on a bigger project. We actually implemented the contract management workflow, and that is the contract process all the way from um, authoring all the way through to execution with redlining, audit trails, SLAs, and reporting, or, and the vendor signature and execution. So we have incorporated that into our out-of-the-box program, and that is so that we could make sure that the entire TPM process was all within one place. So when we're looking at a relationship and we're looking at the status, we can see the entire workflow in one solution. We also, we also implemented um, a Tableau connection so that we could do enhanced reporting. Because as we continue to build our program, we are seeing that there are some efficiencies in doing some Tableau reporting and dashboards so that we can better manage and monitor um, our vendor portfolio. And I have some better examples of what some of those things look like um, later on in my slides. But just to share with you, that is something we implemented in 2019. And this year we are looking at making those reports more robust. So this year, we are looking at a few things to do with our program. We are upgrading our current version of our platform because there are some, there are some new great um, functionality that we would use, like to utilize. Um, one of the most important is being able to update the vendor name because that is a crucial element of any vendor portfolio, making sure that the entity information is always as accurate as it possibly could be. We are also implementing Dow Jones risk alerts this year. Um, that is just so that we can, one, map our entire vendor portfolio to um, all of the vendors, to their business owner. So any risks that come in can be reviewed and addressed as soon as possible. We have hierarchies in, implemented so that um, if it is a medium risk or if it is a high risk, it automatically escalates to that SMC member so that we can do a proper risk review and look at what the impact would be to our relationship with that vendor. And lastly, we've been doing financial viability assessments, um, and that was an efficiency that we wanted to um, win this year, and that was because we were doing financial analysis, but it was taking a very long time, and this year we actually implemented the use of some reports. So we have automated that process so that we can make that 
make the entire thing more efficient so that we can, and it also gives us an alert so that we can continue to monitor those vendors also. So next year, the things that we're looking at, um, looking to implement are external security scorecards. So again, making the process more efficient. We all understand that information security is a big risk. Anything that we can do to give us an easier oversight of those third parties is always going to be and lastly, we're looking at mapping um, the regulations and laws to our questionnaires. As I said, we want to be able to quickly identify if a vendor is compliant, and this will help us know if they have a set filing or they have a litigation or they have they appear on the watch list. It's automatically going to tie that to the vendor and their relationship so that we can quickly do a review and look at the risk um, to our relationship with that vendor. So one of the things that um, we was a big part of what we did um, for 2019 and in 2020 is we've been really honing in on building our framework. And it's important for us to do this because as I said at the beginning, um, the landscape is changing and us having a robust, robust framework helps us to understand what we are doing to address those changes. Um, it's important to establish a robust third party life cycle and building out the framework is the core element for us to be able to do that. So you're, you, we understand that we have to do due diligence. We understand that we've got to do risk assessments, um, but that's not the only thing that drives the cycle. You have to ensure that it covers the dimensions of risk, which you'll see at the top of my um, diagram, the compliance risk, the reputational risk, transactional risk, country risk. These are all risks that all apply over the entire life cycle of your third party program. And it's, it is crucial for you to monitor and manage those risks for each of your relationships and each of your third parties. That could be difficult unless you have some sort of automation or some sort of reporting that is automatically feeding out some of that information. So, like I said, this framework was for us to build out a robust third party risk management program. That is not something that we have achieved every single one of these goals this year. We, as we continue to build out our program, we're going to continue to make all of these things more and more robust as we move closer um, into finalizing our program. As you'll see, I'm demonstrating here the difference between what you do in your planning and due diligence um, phases through to your oversight and accountability and your ongoing monitoring. And it's crucial that we are taking each of these elements into account and revisiting them whenever these risks are occurring. So if I have a risk alert during my oversight and accountability, I'm not just looking at my business continuity, information security and compliance. I'm also looking at my compliance risk. I'm looking at my reputational risk. I'm looking at my transactional risk. So we are looking at each of those dimensions over the entire life cycle. And that is important to understand the risk that a particular item could cause to the organization. So to give you some, again, to give you an idea of some of the things that we are targeting, um, to, again, I'm trying to give you an example of what some of those things look like. So disaster recovery and concentration risk, as you saw in that chart, is one of the areas that we are trying to tackle. However, how do you, how do you show that in a system that could be useful? So concentration risk is something that more organizations are looking at, especially around disaster recovery, BCP and pandemic management. And this is one of the ideas that we are looking to implement within our Tableau reporting, which is taking out all of the primary um, backup locations, but also where their core op operations are located and pinpointing those on a map. Some organizations potentially will not have a concentration risk issue because you're looking at global vendors, so therefore your concentration risk is going to be low. For um, Ag First, as we are an agricultural bank and we are dealing with associations and, and some of their customers, it is we find that we have a higher concentration risk because of the location that we're operating in. So it's crucial for us to manage and monitor that to make sure that we don't have a group of vendors all on one grid. So if we have a backup, if we have a outage in New York, we want to make sure that our vendors who are in New York are not all sitting on the same grid. 
And then we also want to make sure that their backup location is also not sitting on the same grid. So this chart gives a great and easy way to be able to drill down and understand the concentration risk of your vendor database, but also the disaster recovery and BCP planning. Other things that we're looking to do are things like which vendors are linked to our internal BCP, DR and pandemic plans. So again, we're trying to think a little bit more about disaster recovery and concentration risk and how we can better report on those things to make it easier for us to mitigate those items in the future. So I gave you an example here of what we did for our pandemic management. As we all know, um, we're going through a period um, that was never predicted. We didn't know the impact of this was going to be the way it was. So for us, it was identifying our core vendors that were core to our services that we deliver to our associations and issuing out a COVID-19 pandemic questionnaire for us to understand the imp impact to their organizations and therefore the impact to us, whether it's their third, fourth, fifth parties, working from home, making sure they've got policies in place. Um, the last time their plans were um, reviewed and approved and tested. So again, this is just an example of what we did. And we issued this through the third party risk management um, system. And the questionnaires were answered. And we're actually now able to do reporting on those answers. So it, it, it has really helped us to streamline and standardize how we review our third parties inside of our third party management program. So another example, which I gave you earlier was around the external information scorecard. Um, and this is something that we are looking to do, as I said, next year, which is build out um, some dashboards around the information security um, information that we're getting from these external scorecards. Um, and this, again, just gives us a higher level of, of oversight, but it also allows us to get monitoring alerts. Um, we can also drill down. So if anybody remembers when we were at the GRC summit last year, um, Baltimore was actually um, victim to a malware um, incident and the type of malware that hit the organization in a lot of these external scorecard systems, you can actually search for the worm or search for the virus or search for the malware and see um, if any other organization has been impacted or if they identify the vulnerability as to how they, the hacker got into the system, usually it's through a third party um, system or an AP, um, you can actually search on those items as well. So it's a great way for us to, instead of us waiting for a, a incident to happen, we can actually share that information with our third parties and make them aware that there has been a recent incident with this particular software, or there has been a particular incident with a particular um, API or uh, firewall. And they have the ability to address those things before there is an incident. So again, we like to work with our third parties as partners rather than a customer um, third party relationship. So first, first, vice versa, they may share some information with us and say, although they haven't had a breach, they do want to know, they do want to let us know that they have identified this vulnerability and they are addressing it. So it helps us to manage um, our risk, but also keep a great relationship with our third parties. So in here, the next thing I'm going to show you is the financial viability assessment. Um, and again, I'm just trying to show you some examples of the things that we are doing within our roadmap and things that we are targeting to do as next steps in our roadmap. So this is something that we delivered this year, which is doing the financial viability assessments of our vendors. We do not do our entire vendor database every year. We do it phased based on the tiers. So this year we did tier ones, next year we'll do tier ones and tier twos, and the following year we'll do all of our database. So we do all of our database every three years. And this just gives a high level analysis as to the vendor's viability score, um, how they're making payments. It goes into things like, have they got any litigations? Have they um, had changes in their, um, their CEO or their C-suite, I won't say their CEO, their C-suite. Um, again, it gives really crucial information that shows you 
how that company is operating. And I think it's, it's a really useful tool to take when you're doing RFPs or if you're reviewing using a new vendor, financial viability not only is a, re a regulatory requirement is something that is crucial to how the vendor will operate during your relationship so again it is something that we should always be taking into account and then again i was just giving you an example of our contract workflow so our contract workflow as i said is something we built into our application and we have not only got the ability to create the uh the contracts for review. We have a SLAs, as you'll see in this demonstration. They are monitored so that we can keep track of things that are in in um, in progress and overdue. And we can actually manage and record the amount of documents that are also um, within the system, whether they are executed, overdue, or in progress. So again, just giving you a high level overview of the fact that we were successful in implementing this last year. And so far, we since January 1st, we've already put 92 documents through the system. 71 of those have been executed. So it just shows you the robustness of the model that we um, built and implemented into the system. The rollout of our contract workflow, we took a very um, out, dedicated outline as to how we were going to implement um, this into the organization. We have a dedicated project team of various experts across the organization who helped us to um, build out our program through detailed requirements mapping. Um, we had various sessions about what parts of the workflow were important to each stakeholder and made sure that we um, mapped out all of those key criteria. Um, the biggest part of what made this successful was the detailed UAT test scripts. We built out approximately 145 in total and um, this was crucial for us because we needed to make sure that the system was as user friendly as possible and that meant that we needed to test all of the workflows we needed to test all of the fields the functionalities all of the rules and the triggers to make sure that this was is as successful as possible because change is something that all people are avoidant to so making sure that we did everything to avoid any pushback from our users was crucial for us as we were doing this implementation. We actually built out user specific um, user guides and quick reference guides to help them through this change in the system. And we actually had set up a senior management committee oversight, oversight committee, I apologize. Um, and they actually helped us to drive home that message that this was coming from the top down rather than the bottom up. And that was what helped us get the buying from our users, that this was something that the board and our senior management were not only bought into, but, but was going to bring us a sufficient efficiency in our operations. So from a life, life after implementation, has been really great in the sense that we have um, taken on board lots of feedback. We have um, one, we've had one on one ad hoc training with the users after our training sessions. Um, we have a monthly communication that goes out to our um, users and um, that helps us to document to them any changes, anything that potentially they um, have asked us questions about. We have Q and A's. We have a quarterly lunch and learn. That's when we get all of our system users together and we give them lunch and we allow them to ask us everything that they possibly could think of. And it has been a great tool for us to have. So those sessions really started off, as, as you can imagine, making a big change and implementing a system like this. Um, they started off very, um, don't want to say negative, but negative in a way that they were reluctant to the change. Now, um, these sessions are great because we get really good feedback, um, ideas, suggestions on how we can make the program um, better, things that we could look into in the future. So they are really starting to work with us as a partner rather than just a user. So it shows how our process has really been um, embodied by all of our user groups. Uh, we have stakeholder meetings that we have on a regular basis just to keep track of 
what their expectations were to get out of what we're doing in the system and to make sure that we've achieved those um, and things that they may get from the regulators or auditors that they need to do to improve their processes. Um, we always are having conversations about whether we can use the system to make those um, processes more efficient rather than them having to think of a manual process. And one of our biggest tasks um, that we're going to be in, taking on this year is building out um, a training module. So all of our user guides, all of the uh, quick reference guides, we're going to be building out an electronic training um, program so that our users can go in and click on a link and it will show them how to do something in the system without having um, one of my group there. So it's like they have hands on support, although it's all within the system. So that's something that is going to be really beneficial to them to have on hand at any time in the day, wherever they're, wherever they are, they could just click and see how to do something without needing to raise the ticket or setting up a meeting with one of the one of us to help them do something. So that has been our main goals um, after our implementation, which is just looking at how we can continue to make the user experience the best that it possibly could be. So some of the things that we have realized um, since we started this journey in 2018, um, we have, we've really gained some efficiencies. So the SFTP um, connection has really enhanced our reporting and that's what we use to connect to Tableau. And that helps us to identify um, audit and regulatory requirements quicker. It helps us to keep track of um, the tasks and things in the system. Um, and we use those to send out um, notifications, reminders to users to complete things so that things don't go overdue. Um, we have a multitude of um, workflows in the systems with various different processes. We have standardized questionnaires, which makes the entire third party risk identification and mitigation um, processes a lot easier because now we can compare apples and apples. If we're talking about technology companies, I know that technology company A and technology company B, their risk levels are going to be, um, they could be different, but we're reviewing the same information. So whilst we don't have the same questionnaire going to our entire portfolio, if they choose a particular uh, category, or it has a particular risk, they will get the same questionnaire. So we're utilizing the um, the risks and mitigation requirements as a driver for which questionnaires trigger in our system. We've got automated alerts and we've got, um, we have the contract uh, workflow in the system and that has helped us to make sure that the process is continuing to move forward and continuing to, um, to grow as we can, as we go down this road. Cause I think that's the thing with, that everyone is realizing with third party management. There is no end point. We, have, we are having to, to continuously make the process better. We're continuously reviewing the changes that are going to impact our organizations. We're continuously looking at ways that we can make a process that we have implemented more efficient. So yes, we may have a questionnaire that we're sending out to a vendor, but maybe there's a way that we can utilize a questionnaire that they're filling out for multiple vendors in the future. And we can pull that information into the system. So there is no end point and it's a continuous moving entity. But the key here is that from a benefits point of view, um, we are realizing those, we are seeing the benefits of us um, implementing the system and we continuously look at what, what, it, what do we want to tackle next and what's the next big risk that we should be thinking about. So as you can see on my screen, uh, uh, you'll see the kind of statistics that we're pulling out of the system since we started um, this endeavor. You'll see that we have uh, one, uh, 1,000, around that 1,000 third parties. Um, we've executed 89 contracts in the system so far. Um, we have multiple relationships, due diligence. And this is just to give you an idea of the real benefit of, that we're seeing through using the system. So some of these processes like um, the RFPs would have took a long time for us to be able to get through it, do the reviews and get output. Um, the fact that we have implemented 45 um, RFPs since we embarked in on this endeavor shows that the system is working and the processes are working and we're seeing the efficiencies that we um, set out to achieve. So this is the overview of what um, we have achieved 
through our program and I thank you so much for taking the time to listen um, into our journey so far and what we're doing in the future and hope to have any questions and things and speak to you soon. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kai.